Good evening, everyone. Tonight's the sixth show of Harvey Matters, and tonight I've got another fanatical supporter, someone who's well known to many of us. So here we go. Let's get the let's get the show on the road. <laughs> Good evening, Tom. How are you? Good evening. I'm all right, mate. How are you? Not too bad. That music, I think, comes from the Flintstones, doesn't it? It's so old. Quite possibly. I love the images, though. Oh, fantastic. Takes you, takes you back, doesn't it? Right. We, yeah. I should have warned you. There's no uh, five-minute warm-up here. I'm going to get straight into it. Right. No, right. you get stuck in, mate. I'm, I'm ready to go. Good. Good. Lovely. Right. What I want to know is, when did you first, first start going to Highbury? And a, and a question that we ask ourselves every so often, why? Um, it's pretty simple with me, to be honest, uh, Melvin. Um, I started going uh, mid-60s, probably 66, maybe the end of 65, 66, maybe the start of 66, 67. Um, and to be honest, I was North London. I was Holloway. I was like 15 minutes walk from, from Highbury. So, you know, I suppose you're coming off the back of... Tottenham being a successful team, but that was, you know, that was up in bandit country. So I wasn't really going to go up there and um, I could walk to the Arsenal or me and my dad could walk to the Arsenal. So uh, that's, you know, that's why we went there. It wasn't really for any, you know, I was obviously at primary school and that, you know, you play football in the playground and talk about football and all that, but it was never really any question, but it was going to be, it was going to be Arsenal. That was my local club. Yeah, I mean, did, I mean, when you first went to Highbury, did it actually mean anything to you? Or only years later, you sat there and go, wow, or stood there and went, wow, this stadium is something special? Um, no, no, it did It did definitely mean something. I mean, the whole business of going to football meant something, Melvin. And, you know, obviously, Highbury was completely tied in with that. We used to, um, me and the old man, we walk along Holloway Road, then down Mackenzie Road, across Holloway Road, uh, round... Um, Drayton Park, up over Albert Park, and then down Avenel Road to the first turnstiles you come to were um, the clock end turnstiles. So we were, we would uh, go in there, and obviously that, you know, it, I'd never been any, anywhere remotely like it. You know, there is nowhere like a football ground, particularly right, if right. you're 10 years old and impressionable. Um, it might be that if it had been another football ground, I would have been impressed by that. Probably it was later that I realised just how special exactly. the building and just how special the history of Highbury was. But, you know, just to be there with, I mean, we weren't talking huge crowds back then. We were pretty, it was a pretty rubbish team. And, you know, people, you, you'd turn up on the day. So apart from kind of the North London derby, Man United, maybe, you know, a few London derbies and stuff, there, would, there wouldn't be kind of capacity crowds. You wouldn't have 60,000 in there. But, just to be in there with kind of 35 or 40 was like nothing I'd ever experienced, you know. It was um, it was fantastic. In yeah, fact, I remember that more than I remember the football, to be honest. <laughs> you, well, you're clever actually doing that because I still remember some of the football. It weren't very good at that time. Yeah, well, so I started going about the same time as you, Tom. I, I started going religiously because it is like our religion, isn't it? I started going religiously, I think, in 1965, around that time when we had like... Uh, Bertie me, not Bertie me, sorry. Joe Baker was sent forward with George Eastham. We had Billy Wright as manager. That era, that's when I was growing yeah, up yeah. Starting the Arsenal. So we're, we're similar, yeah. but it's parallel in that respect. But, I mean, I used to, I mean, years ago, you didn't have to, have, you couldn't have a ticket. Unless you had a seat or a seating ticket, you couldn't have, a, you had to wait or queue up people for a big game, but an ordinary game. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You turned up on the no, day. Absolutely. Got in when you, where you could, and some days you can get anywhere you like, really, when, when the football's really that bad. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you. I mean, you couldn't get tickets for the, all the standing areas. You just paid on the turnstile sort yeah. of thing. The only thing was for cup finals, really. The only time you'd you'd stand, but have to get a ticket in advance. And the the first time I remember doing that was the seventy one cup final. You know, the, I stood, but you did have to have a ticket. 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, plenty of people didn't, obviously. You know, giving in the Wembley for cup finals was kind of was a, a time honoured tradition, I suppose. Um, which is why you always sort of laugh when they said, "Oh, you know, Wembley at hundred thousand capacity." And you go, "Yeah, right. There's a few more than that in here." Mm-hmm. Um, so, no, absolutely, it was just, and and you knew if you, you know, if you're playing, I don't know, you're playing Ipswich Town, you could probably turn up at quarter to three and get a decent place or if you were playing Tottenham you'd need to be there by 12 30 yeah. to have you know to find a decent spot maybe a, a stanchion to lean against that kind of thing but but me and the old mate well, I used to like going down there early we used to like going down there early sort of you know you'd watch the ground fill up you'd have a chat with all these people who always stood around you um and uh, just kind of sing a few songs and um it, it that was so we we tend to go early anyway but you definitely you're right you didn't need to a couple of things so you just said jib in i haven't had that expression for years jibbing in what an expression fantastic expression that <laughs> well it's, it, well it's just north london isn't it? <laughs> exactly oh, oh um you see when I, got, I used to get there early as well not as early i didn't get as oh, well, we got there just after that and a lot of the games and i used to go and we always used a ritual it's a ritual but we used it we always used to get a program because when you're there early, you have something to do. You have a few songs, like you say, have a chat with a few guys around you. But also, you used to go through the program, didn't you? Because you had, that's how you found out things about your club because there was no internet then or anything like that. No, there weren't. Although, to be fair, the Islington Gazette was a really good Arsenal paper back then. Um, and uh, obviously, that was my local paper. So it wasn't so much. Um, I mean, there were two things, really. I, you know, I've, I've still got the programme from every Arsenal game I've ever been to at home. Do you know what I mean? So there was that sort of... That was, there was that old stamp collecting bit about it. You know, oh, I'll go into the game, got to get a programme, take the programme home, look through it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Maybe write the score on the uh, team sheet on the back page and all that. Um, but also, we didn't... When I first started going, it probably didn't feature first couple of seasons but then from 67 68 it mattered because of course on the on the back of the program uh, in the corner there would be um like a voucher numbered voucher and if if you wanted to get a ticket to the cup final that's it that's it so if you had to cut all that if you if you got to a cup final the week before the cup final the programme would have like this pink or green sheet in the middle of it. And you'd have to pull that out and cut off all the little triangles that you collected off the back of the programme and fill them up. And as long as you filled, filled it up or nearly, then that got you, you know, that you could buy a, a, a cup final programme. Problem was, of course, we got to, um, I mean, I think uh, the two League Cup finals, Leeds and Swindon, um, we was in seats and uh, it, the old man must have got them somehow or other. He did know one or two people who were connected to the school he worked at in uh, in Holloway. Um, but the 1971 Cup final, I remember, that you've got the thing. But we only had one programme, which meant we only had one set of vouchers. Oh, so we only no. got one Cup final ticket. So what happened? Um, well, he did the decent thing. He went. <laughs> no, I'm not. What are you talking about? No, absolutely. Because to be honest, he went because he started going to Arsenal because I wanted to start going to Arsenal. He weren't. He weren't. He didn't have history with that. He was from. Uh, he grew up in Dover. His thing was what Kent County Cricket Club and fishing for sea bass off Dover Beach. You know, off um, Shakespeare Beach down in Dover. That was his thing. Football wasn't really his thing, but he did start. He, he got a job. He was a teacher and he got a job at Holloway School, which was a massive football school you know Charlie George and people like that went there and there were there were actually um Bob Wilson was actually on the staff there um and uh yeah it was it was a big football school so when I started playing football in the street and then wanting to go to Arsenal he went yeah go on then and he did to be fair to him he did get the bug quite quickly he was he was pretty committed as well and because of that incident over the 71 Cup final, the following season, we got season tickets in the East Lower. As much as anything, not because we didn't like standing on the clock end, it was great on the clock end, but we wanted to make sure we thought 
oh well we've we've cracked it now we'll be in cup finals every year um yeah. uh, and actually we were the following year um so you you know you could um we were sure because we had two season tickets that meant we were sure of two cup final tickets when you when you first started going i mean did you have your favorite players um to be honest the player are always um the player are always kind of i, I didn't they weren't like um yeah john radford john oh. radford was was the fella for me I, you know like when you're playing football in the street or in the playground and you want to look i was always useless at football i was never a good player or anything like that but we play headers and volleys outside my house in the street there was like a garage like a, a builder's yard next to where i lived and the, the it had two big black painted gates um sort of maybe eight foot high and so it was it was perfect for goals for a goal and we just play headers and volleys against that and so I would always be John Radford that was always who I wanted you know I'd be going I'm John Radford I knew I wasn't I knew I weren't any good but that was I, I like John Radford and there was something about the fact that he was a centre forward that wore number seven I thought that's that's a bit different that yeah um you know and I'm lucky to have got to know John um over the years and he's a yeah he's a fantastic man and, you know they say never meet your heroes and you know I got to meet and got to know and even got to play football with most of that double team um, for the Arsenal Vets team and then the Arsenal X-Pro and Celebrity Eleven and um, you know, and they say don't meet your heroes. They are pro oh, just a fantastic group of human beings. Do you know what I mean? Bob and, and Frank and uh, Peter Storey, John Radford, George Armstrong, um, Eddie Kelly, George Graham, these people there. David Court, um, who was who, uh, who was still at the club then, John Samuels, they just great people, Melvin. Great and they, people. And also, I mean, I spoke to Ju was on this program the, uh, a couple of nights ago, and we we're just talking about how close they were and how close they still are. That that group. Of yeah, players. absolutely. No, that was that is. It's always fantastic to be around them. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. They are real. You know. Um, and and they will always, obviously, you know, some are in better health than others now yes, to get into right. that time sort of thing. But if you you know if there's a if there's a, a a double reunion thing on, everybody tries to get there. Do you know what I mean? They really there is a and you you kind of you're around them and you can tell there's this genuine, you know, it was something very special they achieved together, and you can tell that bond is still as as strong as it ever was. And that's great. That's great. Yeah, it's fabulous. I mean, as I say, I've heard so many stories from Jill and other people as well about them. And uh, it's true what you say. It's absolutely true. Did you have any, I mean, if you don't, it doesn't matter, but just as a throwaway, do you have any real favourite moments or matches at Highbury? You go, you know what? It doesn't have to be those seasons, Tom. Oh, but mate. Match, you know what? Oh, Remember at Highbury? Are you, are you you're joking? And I mean, that's like... So many. And that's difficult. I've got... I've got a million, yeah, no. million matches. I know. But one that, one that, all right, around that time. Let's, let's, let's narrow it down. Let's go around about that time when you first went, the first few seasons. Well, the, the, ob the obvious one that stands out, which is still, I think, still my number one favourite Arsenal moment, even though there's everything else, my, my number one favourite Arsenal game of all time. And, you know, this is someone who, you know, I was at Anfield in 89. I was at, uh, in Palmer in, in 94. I, you know, I've been so lucky. We've all been so lucky that we yeah. ended up supporting the Arsenal. because We've seen some stuff. But that um, that Fairs Cup final second leg against Anderlecht. Oh, was, yeah. That was, <laughs> um, that was, that really was the night for me. Do you know what I mean? That, it was just, we'd been to two cup finals the previous two seasons. Um, lost to Leeds, lost to Swindon. You know, and then this this kind of this this Fairs Cup thing, and that was when the Fairs Cup was a proper. Yes. You know, you, there, there, there was more than one. I mean, it was an amazing night. We beat we beat, beat Dinamo back out. That's um, right. Yeah, that's it. Remember that seven one. You go Arsenal don't beat anyone seven one. Do you know what I mean? It was, yeah. and then of course in the semi final, 
what still stands out, probably the best individual oh, yeah. performance by a player I've ever seen was Charlie oh, George. Yeah, Ajax, Charlie I mean, Ajax. Ajax. You know, Ajax, the following three seasons running, they were European Cup winners. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, you're talking you know, Johan Cruyff, Johan Niskins, all these people. Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely hammered them. Beat them 3 0. And Charlie was, you know, all the talks about Johan Cruyff and all these. And you went, Charlie George better than any of these. <laughs> and then, you know, and then the final was just, you know, we'd lost the first, well, I'm telling you what you already know, but we'd lost the first leg 3 1. And that, that goal right at the end in Brussels changed everything. You thought, maybe, maybe. And then once Eddie Kelly scored right in front of us, I was on the clock end for that. And once Eddie Kelly scored after about 20 odd minutes, you thought the whole stadium just, the, it, we won it by force of will. Do you know what I mean? It's hammering yes. down with rain, the pitch is all muddy. Yes. Analect didn't know what hit him. Absolutely no. did not know what hit him. And you know that, um, well, John Radford, the, the right aforementioned right got the second goal, and that was it. The, the yeah. route. You know, it just, well, obviously there wasn't a roof on the clock in, but the rest of the stadium, the roof's come up and, you know, John Samuel's got the, everybody's on the yeah. pitch at the end. It was just, it was just the most incredible. And, you know, Arsenal hadn't won anything since 1953. Yeah, that's right. So all I'd had was two, three years of old geezers, you know, who stood around us going, oh, it's not like the old days. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm blinding about what a load of rubbish it was, and then suddenly you've, you've got a night like this, and you can see them. You know, you see them, the, these people you've been watching football with for two, three seasons, and they're like in tears. They're all jumping on the pitch, climbing over the little uh, metal fence, metal, metal railing at, uh, at the bottom of the cross. See, see the whole yeah, thing. I'll, I'll give you a name now. You threw an old name at me. I want to give one to you now, nostalgic name. I went there, I was 16 years old, I bought something, took it to the ground, met my uncle who used to take me, my father, they were in the good, some decent seats, I wasn't, and I met him after the game with bottles of baby sham. Oh, okay, after that game? Yeah, okay. baby yeah, sham, maybe I, was baby champagne. I wasn't allowed to, at 16, you wouldn't have, I didn't have enough money to buy a bloody bottle of champagne, but baby sham, I just about could, you know, get it together and do oh, it. Yeah, well, I suppose that's the yeah, styles, Tom, without them knowing, that's the thing. But that's the thing, isn't it? That's that's why that is so, you know, your memories of those times are so clear, Melvin, because that was the time, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17 is when you get, you got hooked on football and yeah. hooked on the whole, you know, there weren't, there, weren't other, there weren't other stuff to do. Do you know what I mean? It was just, that was it. It was Arsenal. And, um, and, you know, you went through those kind of, funny enough, there wasn't any, uh, any drink taken after the Andlet game, but I remember the following year, went up to Tottenham, the night we won the league at Tottenham, um, we come out afterwards, you know, it was on uh, on the pitch there as well, by the way, but then when we finally got, and we ended up walking back from t Tottenham, Art Lane, all the way back to Holloway, um, we'd walked up there, uh, the old man was teaching at Tottenham Park School by then, so I bunked off the afternoon, um, and met him at Tolleton Park. He, me and him have walked up to Tottenham, got in in time, went in the paddock at Spurs because you thought we've probably got a better chance getting in there. Got in the paddock and come away afterwards and we're walking back down the road. We've had nothing to eat, nothing to drink, nothing, you know. And he actually took me in the pub and bought me half a lager. <laughs> I bet that tasted nice. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Oh, amazing, amazing. I'm going to go just a couple of things I'm going to do, not big time. Go through a, a couple of games from the era, that era, that you may remember, sometimes not for football in terms. Here we go, look at this one. Do you remember it? Can you see what game that is? It's an FA Cup tonight. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, two goals by Alan Ball, 2-1. Uh, I actually went to the first game as well. Two all the first game, wasn't it? I went to that there. as well. That was when Charlie yeah. Jules got a good one, wasn't it? Charlie Jules got, and Osgood got a cracker as well, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, it was a big we crowd. They were, two, one up to all. they were two big yeah. crowds there. What was there. special about that game, apart from us getting through? What else was special about it? Um, well, look, it was... The thing is, I'm just trying to look for the date on there, 72, so, 73. So that was... You know, what you've got to remember, the strange things happened after the double season. Um, you know, and a lot of people who've been 
really, really key to us doing the double disappeared. Yeah, we I let the team go too early, Tom, didn't we? we I think particularly early. Frank McClintock and Charlie George. Yeah. Um, the, the whole team was in the process of shifting and changing. And funny enough, I think the biggest thing was not the player who left. It was actually a player who came in, Alan Ball. Record transfer fee. He was on far more money than anybody else in the dressing room. World Cup winner in his white boots and all that. And, you know, even, even watching from the stands, you thought, there's something not quite right about this. You could see, because on his day, Alan Ball was a class oh, apart. Fantastic. You know what I mean? Absolutely a class apart. And that game, that Chelsea game, I'm pretty sure he... I'm not sure if he scored both goals. I think the winner was a penalty. He got one of them. Kennedy got the winner. Yeah, well, but he got a penalty. Kennedy yeah. got the winner. But Alan Ball got right. a penalty. And that's the big thing. Do you remember what happened? There was, a, I think, okay. Julie Armstrong got fouled. And the ref didn't get the penalty. And Frank McClintock physically took the referee over to the linesman. They had a chat. Oh, okay. and they gave a penalty. And that was never done years ago. Right. No, I don't, I don't remember that. that. How we, you know, that was it. Now, this is a game that really upset me at the Highbury that, that season. Oh, wrong one. Sorry. Got the wrong one. Where's the Derby one? Here we go. Derby. Home to Derby. I'll tell you what upset me. What Go happened on. was we were going for the league again. We were just behind yeah. Liverpool. We, we, we were having a good run. We were two, I think, two or three points behind Liverpool. We had about four or five games to go. What happened was in a, in, we made a mistake at the back and Derby scored. They, and we could not get a goal, whatever we tried. We didn't play yeah. well. We didn't really deserve a goal, Tom. And that after that, I think we had another three, three or no, we had another six games to the end of the season. I think we only won one or two right. out of the six so, games. And that was our title thing. That was the start of our title being finished. And that was, that yeah. was the title. Yeah, you know? well, I, I must admit, I don't, I don't remember that game. Although well, Derby have done that well, a few times, haven't they? You remember in 89, they've come and won at Highbury. And we yes. lost it at the end of the world. Oh, that's um, right, of course. It'd be 2 1 or something, wouldn't it? 3 1, I mean, 2 1, maybe, maybe yeah. even 3 1. But I mean, but the thing is, 72 73, you've got to remember that was a you know, that was a good Derby site, yeah. Uh, they were not that was kind of Derby under Brian Clough, and uh, you know, that was the Derby County that, that Charlie went and joined. Do you know what I mean? When right. Dave Mackay took over, um, Charlie went off and, and joined them, so you know, they were kind of you know, they were always there or thereabouts in um, for for league titles and stuff in the, in the early 70s. So, um, you know, it wouldn't necessarily have come as a shock that they turned us over. Disappointment, I get that. But I'm it not was. sure it would have come as a shock because they were a good team. I think we were second I'm in the there. league. Yeah. Then, Tom. Um, Liverpool were top. Yeah. We were second. Yeah. Just when rules are caught after that. And this one is a very famous one, not for football in terms. You know that, why that is famous? Same season. It was a horrible game. It finished nil-nil. It was a rubbish game. Nothing happened apart from one thing. So I tell oh, you, go on, it, go on, the referee. Oh, that's the Jamil one. That's the Jamil one. That's the that's it. That well done. One? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. The ref. Was it the ref or one of the linesmen who I'm went to Jimmy Hill and ended up running the line? Lines. Yeah. But Jimmy Hill came on in his tracksuit bottoms. And he had to borrow yeah. a pair of shoes from someone. Yeah. Two or yeah. something, he said, or two small no, that's anyway. Right. That's right. It kind of killed. I do remember it now. Yeah, I wouldn't have been able to tell what season that was, but I do remember that. And that's, you know, to be honest, that absolutely killed that game because it, it was all, it, it all had a bit of the circus about it. it was, yeah. It was, uh, it, it was, it was, you know, one of those Arsenal Liverpool is normally a fantastic game, isn't it? But as you say, that situation just, just killed it. It really did. Um, what else happened? Did it, did, uh, yeah. What's happened? There? Um, this one I want to show you actually, just before we move on. You won't be able to read this, but I will read it out to you. So I've got it here. It's got the Arsenal. Is it this one? The Arsenal Apprentice, 1972 3, Tom, right? Yeah, okay. A, a William Liam Brady as an apprentice. Yeah. You, you can look at a few of those to be. You can look at a few of those to be honest. Um, you know, Frank Stapleton's there. Trevor Ross. How you can see? I mean, Frank, Frank, my Frank Stapleton. Frank Stapleton. You know, was the greatest centre forward of his generation. 
absolutely yeah, killed us when he left. Um, you know, Richie Powlin would have had a great career if it hadn't been injured, though, didn't he? Badly yeah. injured, that's what done him. And then see, you got David Donaldson McKinnon. He was David Donaldson, wasn't he? When he played, he was David Donaldson, not, Is not right? David McKinnon. John Matthews, his little boy, went to Highbury Grove. Um, who else is there? My, uh, yeah, Liam Brady. So, you know, I mean, you, you look and you go, and to be honest, Billy Wright really started that. You look, that, that list of apprentices there, it's half of them ended up playing first-team football. And two of them went on to be absolute. Frank Stokelton and Liam Brady were the best in their positions in the oh, country. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? Liam, just the best left foot ever. And Frank Stapleton, just as an all-round centre-forward, I, I really do think he was he, he was the best around. He was he was fantastic, fantastic. He had player. everything, didn't he, Tom, as a centre-forward? Oh, yeah, yeah, the lot. The, the lot. He could play with back to goals. goals. He had 20 goals. He was brilliant. Yeah. He was brilliant. So you look at that list of apprentices, you know, half that team went on and had played first-team football or better. For Arsenal, yeah. you know, even people like Trevor Ross, who, you know, unless you were around at the time, you wouldn't remember. But you know, Trevor Ross was a kind of a number f played number four. He was a kind of def well, he's a box to box midfielder, really, but played more on the defensive side. Um, you know, and had a really good career. P played first team football at Arsenal. Actually, Everton. went on and had a better career at Everton, That's it, Everton um, yeah. than he did with us. But um, you know, and you see that, and you go, that is something. That's always been part. Any, all, all the kind of successful Arsenal teams, bar perhaps, bar perhaps the Invincibles. Although even there, you had Ashley and you had you had uh, Ray Parler, but we've always had teams that were built around homegrown players, um, and it does make a difference. Of course, it um, does. And you know, you were talking about the togetherness of that, of that, um, that double team in '71, and. You know, you're talking there about half that team were homegrown players. You know, you look at, at Pat Rice, at um, Peter Simpson, at Eddie Kelly, Peter Story, John Radford, George Armstrong, all of them, John Samuels, all of them had come through as youth players under Billy Wright in the 60s. <clears throat> and that kind of did carry on. And you see there, you know, that's... Um, that's another generation coming through. Two absolute superstars in Stapleton and Brady, and then four, maybe five players who who had first team careers at Arsenal. But you think about the players. I mean, I've spoken to people about this before. But the, our double squad must have had eight or nine people that Billy Wright brought through. Not not you know when he was manager, he put money or put his efforts into the youth team. And we had eight or nine players. You think about it coming through. They're in the double squad, and the double squad is only yeah. about six. 17 players so it's about half, 16. The, half the squad so it's half the yeah. squad isn't it you think about that yeah. half the squad wins the double how about absolutely. that absolutely absolutely yeah and then growing up about i don't know if you were probably too old so was i but just before this i used to get this oh yeah <laughs> well, that's good that was my christmas present yeah. One of my christmas. <clears throat> thing was that yeah no i, I, I did um i was never a great fan of them for some reason no, I didn't really want to read about anybody else. All I wanted to read about was the Arsenal. I only wanted pictures of the Arsenal. I didn't really care about anybody else. <clears throat> you look at that cover. You got, you got, um, you know, you got, uh, you got Rodney Marsh. You got West Ham v West Brom by the look of it. You got Dennis Law. You got a Tottenham. You know, we got Martin Peters. Why would I? Why would I buy something? Why would I buy something with a Tottenham player on the cover? That's true. That's true. Well, my mum didn't know a lot about football, so she bought it for me, and that and the oh, Charles Buckingham right. annual and all. Tom, Tom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, it's another game. Very, very quickly, let's be the last one. But this is the one game that uh, was again famous, not so much for the football. So I got something written on there. I don't know. My uncle oh. had written something on that. Oh, Arsenal like, is, that, is, that, is that the game where Sammy dropped his shoes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Fancy yeah. Me remembering that. Well, it's just I saw Coventry. I knew it was against Cobb. I didn't. I wouldn't have, again, I wouldn't have had the faintest idea. Another homegrown player, Sammy Nelson. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I would never have uh, been able to tell you what season it was, but I did see Cov, and because you picked it out, if it's Cov, you ain't picking it out because it's some brilliant game. Um, 
so I thought it must be, um, yeah, it, it must be, uh, it, it must have been that one. It's the story, if people don't know, where Sammy scored an own goal, got a bit of stick from the crowd, and then went up the other end and scored and put all his shorts down to the crowd. He got banned for, the for that, didn't he? I think. Yeah, I think he did, actually. I think he did get a ban for that. Yeah, hear me. He, everyone who sees him, must, I imagine, mentions that about him. Not all the great games he played for us, but the time he put all his shorts down. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Going back to that era, 73... There's a couple of things that came out around about then, just to cast your mind back. One of them was Roe v. Wade was actually then in 73. Okay. Wow. Roe v. Wade. Um, wow. Also, the United States stopped. Which is all getting undone. It's all getting undone at the moment, isn't it? Like 50 years on and you think, are we really making progress? Well, <laughs> funny you should say that. Um, it's got here, UK inflation rate running at 8.4%. <laughs> So what you say is true. What's happened in between? Oh, no, I, I look, you know, <clears throat> obviously it's a very, very difficult time for a lot of people. Yeah. But, you know, I remember when I got my first ever mortgage, that was sort of 10 years after this, first time I got a mortgage, I was paying something like 14% interest. I mean, that oh, was just... What what was it? Yeah, something like that. I was a first-time buyer, do you know what I mean? It was... A, I, it was, it was Maybe I'm maybe I've misremembered, but it was it was definitely double figures, definitely wow. double figures. Uh, then again, the place only cost eighty grand, so what you know? What's the odds? Um, it is, but you do, you do wonder sometimes. You do wonder sometimes. Oh dear! And there's just a couple of what things cost. Things that are out that were totally out of sync. For example, a Pi twenty two inch color TV, Tom. Cost over 200 quid. And in today's money, if it was with inflation, it cost you 1,900 quid all those years ago. That yeah, yeah. yeah. Down. Things that inventions no, come down good. in price, don't they? Well, and that was, you know, that was something that people wanted around then. Because, of course, 1970 was the first World Cup that was shown on television in colour. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was a great World so Cup, wasn't like it? Like 1966, all we'll watched it in black and white. Didn't see the World Cup in colour until that excellent, excellent film, Goal, come out, which was a movie. I remember that. Yes, I remember that, Goal. That was in in colour. I mean, it's absolutely, I mean, if if people haven't seen it and get the chance to, it's absolutely beautiful. Well, one, it's great memories, you know, a great England team and an amazing summer. But actually, just as a film, as a thing to look at, 70s Technicolor was just fantastic you you know even now it doesn't look the same now it's clearer right. it's crisper but it hasn't got that and and the 1970 world cup was the same it was um that but that was actually on television in color that was broadcasting color obviously most of us watched it in black and white but um it was it was televised in color so color tvs were, were a thing but like you say absolutely a luxury item of course it was. My first cup final I saw in colour, I went around with some neighbours, was the Leicester City, Man City one. When Nish scored, Nish, no, Young scored the winner. Yeah, 69. That, 69? Yeah, 69, yeah. yeah. That's the first. But, but the, when you talk about the 70 World Cup, that was my, I know England won it in 66, but I take that out of the equation, 1970 was my favourite World Cup. It was well, I think it's everybody. Yeah, it's everybody's favourite World Cup, isn't it? Um, you know, and all for different reasons. But uh, you know, I, I, it's funny. I, I've just been uh, I've helped Paul Davis with his autobiography recently, uh, Arsenal and After, which is out at the moment. Right. And um, you know, he talks about, and of course, different people have different perspectives. But he went, he he remembers the 1970 World Cup and just thinks, like these are people who look like me. And they're the best players in the world. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he's at Arsenal, or going to be at Arsenal. You know, when he turns up for the first time, he's the only black player, the only black kid at Arsenal. Brendan yes. Batson kind of been and gone. And so he was, you know, this is, but the 1970 World Cup, they're like, and people, for, you know, everybody fell in love with that Brazil team. Oh, and to man. hear 
black players described as the best in the world. Can you imagine what that meant to Paul yeah. and to other young, you know, young kind of black schoolboy players trying to make a way in, in what was still then overwhelmingly a white game. To hear, to see what, what Pele and Giazzino and, and all of those were doing and Tostau and um, Carlos Alberto and to, to see what they were doing and also to hear how everybody was talking about. You well, know, you think about it, Tom. You, you're sort of, the only, the only uh, football you saw on television, apart from the, the uh, FA Cup roundabout then, would be the odd European game if an English club was involved, right? For English yeah. clubs, there wouldn't be any black players playing for the other teams either. Well, there'd be, you know, what you had was... You might have a Portuguese. You get a few Portuguese you might get. But no, that would be the what, country what, I can think of. Because me and Paul talked about that quite a lot. There were there were one or two. There were one or two in lower leagues. But also there was Clyde Best at West Ham. So maybe not yeah, seeing him long. About, but you're talking about one percent I'm talking about. That's what it was like. Oh, yeah, it was tiny. It was tiny. Yeah. I think you know, the first one I saw was Albert Johansson of Leeds, who played left wing. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Did you say best? Yeah, right through to, you know, Paul made his debut, what, in 1980 at White Hart Lane. That's right. Um, and, you know, he was the only black player in the Arsenal team and Chrissy Hewton was in the Tottenham team and that was it. Was it really? It. There was no others? Yeah. No. Well, no, not at all. No not bad. at all. Um, and, you know, he would for a long while, you know, until you had, well, I mean, Rath Mead came along a little, uh, quite soon after, Chrissy White came along a li uh, quite soon after, but, you know, Paul, when he started, was was uh, you uh, often the, the only white player, uh, black player in the in the Arsenal team, often the only black player on the pitch. Can you wow. imagine going to, you know, clubs, because after clubs wouldn't have any black players. You know, oh, you go to the Sunderland's or the Newcastle sort of, and the stick and the, you know, that was just accepted. Well, you know, it's, it's just, amazing it, to think about it. Well, absolutely. And obviously, you know, that Paul's generation, you know, the kind of, um, you know, Cyril Regis and, and Garth Crooks and Chrissy Hewitt and, and people like that did make a huge difference. They did pave the way for, you know, because by the end of Paul's career, you had, you had Dave Rocastle, God rest his soul. You had Michael Thomas. You had Gus Caesar. You had Ian Wright. You had all these, you know, dressing rooms have changed out of all recognition. Problem is, of course, Melvin, that um, the people who are running dressing rooms hasn't changed. Managers no. and coaching, the numbers are still haven't moved at all. Yes, exactly. When you look at the numbers and you go, hold on a minute, the percentage doesn't make, doesn't add up, does it? I no, mean, absolutely. You know, you're looking at, you're looking at a top flight where what? I think it's around forty percent of 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 Premier League players are are of um, you know black or ethnic minority from black or ethnic minority backgrounds, um, and managers and is in, in positions of, of real you know in, in in the Premier League. There's only one. Patrick Vieira is the only black manager, and then you look at both at managers, first team coaches, um, and. Uh, more particularly at kind of directors of football, directors, chief executives. You know, I mean, obviously, kind of Vinay is flying the flag at Arsenal at the moment, but it's very, very rare still in 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 kind of the the sort of once you get past the dressing room into the corridors of power in, in English football, it's still a very, very white environment. It is. It is. It's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, this it doesn't, day, reflect, doesn't reflect what's going on on the pitch, and of course no. it should. No. I mean, I, I don't know where I saw it. There was a game someone put on Facebook or somewhere that, that Arsenal, there was a team we had over 11 black players. And I've got to tell you, every one of those were nearly world class. It was yeah. in the uh, Henri era. I mean, we yeah. had a team. And to think that, you know, Years ago, we could only have one black player, if that. And now, thank God, we had a team that were the pure pick purely on their skill. And it happens to yeah. be that that's how the how it worked out. And it's brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely good, like you say, yeah. the glass ceiling. And that and it's very difficult to get no, the glass ceiling. Absolutely. 
you know, because if, if you've got that many black players playing, then why aren't there that many black managers picking the team? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, you know, you, you can tell me about one manager or this man, you know, oh, that's the reason why that person hasn't made progress or that, but all of them. You can, you can always make an excuse. No, but you there's only one. You can always make an excuse about one. Yeah. yeah. You can always yeah. make an excuse about one. But when you look at the overall picture, there's only one reason why. Yeah, of course. Of course. Of course it is. Of course it is. Um, well, also, I mean, going back to the when we the pair of us started going, I mean, we, I've mentioned this before, but half time scores, you didn't have a clue what was going on until half time. And the geese used to come around in the corner and put the, where the. Uh, <laughs> the program of letters by each uh, game yeah and, yeah it's significant yeah. the guys the half time put the scores in waiting for the spurs score to come up because they were away if the home team scored everyone cheered and then we saw what yeah the spurs, yeah the now i must admit i never paid i never paid much attention i mean to be fair you were just on arsenal were you, the, Tom? well stood in the middle of the clock and you're struggling to see the call oh, both sides side. yeah true yeah, yeah anyway and of course, I'm more I'm more interested in what's going on on the pitch to see whether the fella at the front of the band is going to drop his mace. Oh yes, you know, that, was, that was my half time entertainment. Not because oh. there'd be people around. There was always people around with radios and all that. Do you know what I mean? If we were like if we were pushing for the league or something, people would always say, "Oh, Leeds are losing" or whatever it was. Do you know what I mean? It, um, you'd always kind of pick that up without. I found you'd always pick that up without. Without yeah. needing to see those funny scoreboards, but you know, you never had that conversation on before 1970, did you? Let's face it. If it Say again. Past, you never had that conversation before 1970. If Arsenal were going to win the league, seeing what the other teams are doing, it was only really the Leeds, the 1970-71 season, we started worrying about teams at the top. Um, I don't know. Actually, I think my memory, actually, Melvin, is that what used to happen was, I think. Definitely the two, maybe the three seasons before that, we made good starts to the season. Mm. We kind of come out of the blocks quite quick. And, yeah. then, you know, we'd be beating teams threes and fours. And then, but by November, it, it would all have fallen apart. So at the start of the season, you might be interested in what other people were doing. Just we, you're right, we didn't tend to feature come the end. But. No. I mean, football has changed, obviously, exponentially over the last 10 years, let alone 50 years. But things like there wasn't there was always a replay in an FA Cup tie. You could play somebody five times in an FA Cup. You wouldn't toss a coin. You wouldn't have penalties. There'd be no nothing like that. You had to wait until someone scored more goals than the other team. I mean, I yeah. suppose with European football coming more on on side, there was no time for that. You had to change things. That was it. No, absolutely. Did you um, were you lucky enough to outside the ground eat a hot dog with those horrible onions? Do you remember when they used to open those things up? You know, it was I'll be, I'll be in water. In water. I couldn't even walk past it. Melvin, I've got to tell you, I've never quite understood that. Nor me. I've <laughs> always managed to get through 90 minutes without food. Do you know what I mean? I never, it never I kind peanut. of. That was my little thing peanuts. I love the roasted peanut the geese used to sit outside, take them into the ground, shell peanuts. Wait, yeah, the, well, the fella, the fella used to bring them around, didn't he? That's right, yeah. 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 That was brilliant. Um, also, someone actually mentioned today on one of the blogs that uh, he's still got his rattle from years ago. You know those horrible yeah. rattles? If Arsenal yeah, scored yeah. that back, otherwise you could be in trouble when they come around. I mean, they were big, bloody, heavy things, weren't they? No, absolutely. I never took one. Never, no interest. I just couldn't. No. I don't think I had the strength to hold one, to be honest with you. They were big old things, weren't they? Yeah. That was it. Um, yeah. Did you ever go to the reserve games at Highbury Tom? Yeah, I did used to go to reserve games at Ivory. Yeah, yeah. Um, I um, didn't really realise at the time how lucky I was. I used to go and I used to go and stand, uh, sit at the back of the East Lower, and I would just go and sit with this lovely old gentleman who would talk to me about the game. And it was only it was some time after that. That I kind of went in the Arsenal shop and I realised that this old fella that I'd made kind of made tracks for because my old man never used to go to um, reserve games. If he was free on the Saturday and Arsenal were away, we'd go. If it was if it anywhere kind of Birmingham or South of Birmingham, then we'd yeah, go yeah. if my old man yeah. had the day free. But if we didn't, then I'd go to the reserve games. And I realised that the, this lovely man I've been sitting next to was Jack Kelsey. Well, the goalkeeper? Yeah. Who, of course, was, you know, 
absolutely legendary goalkeeper, but before my time, Welsh international goalkeeper. But also, when he retired, Arsenal opened their first club shop and they gave Jack the concession for it. You know, Jack, Jack ran the club shop. So it meant like reserve games, the shop would be open, I guess. I never used to go to it then, but the shop used to be open. But then obviously when the game's on, they'd shut up. Jack would come in, sit up. I can still remember the kind of the back row of the East Stand, uh, lower, towards the clock end. Um, and, I, you know, it got to a point where, you know, I must have sat next to him once and chatted and, you know, um, I was still quite young. But, he, he you know, he, he just seemed like a really lovely bloke. So I'd kind of then make the point when I went to reserve games of finding this old geezer. And it was only later that I realised who he was. I mean, he won the player, the goalkeeper of the tournament in one of the World Cups. It might have been 58 or 62. It it could only have been 58 because that's the only World Cup that Wales have ever qualified for. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, Until this year. Until this year. Of course, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we talk about uh, people, what they were like. I mean, you... Years ago, I used to stand out before a game sometimes, stand out when I was a bit older with my uncle and father. We had then, years later, we had a season ticket. So we could afford to get to the ground or go in a bit later. And yeah. we used to stand outside the marble halls, opposite the opposite side, so we could see the mm. marble halls, opposite side of the road, if you like. And the players used to come out and mingle with the crowds, having a chat. They used to have mates of theirs. They used to have a little chat. So-and-so was not playing today. And that, was for me, that was like... I was in heaven. You can imagine this guy here is going to play for Arsenal in half hour and he's chatting to this guy next to me or he might nod to my dad or something. You know, it's like it blew my mind. It really, Even though it happened week after week, it might happen, different players, but it just blew my mind. I just couldn't get my head around it. Yeah, yeah. So, it was so good for me, those, those times. So good. I don't know if you were... Uh, I mean, did you meet anyone else famous before you, you, you know, in your... Up to your teens or a bit older, did you meet anybody? Any other out like somewhere you didn't expect to see an Arsenal player? No, well, like I say, Bob Wilson used to um, work at my dad's school. He used to teach PE because Bob was an amateur when he started at Arsenal, okay. um, and he kind of kept it going. He kept the connection with Holloway going. So I, I do remember every now and again, I think the old man used to tap him up for tickets for away games. <laughs> um, I did meet him a couple of times in car parks at away games, you know, when we were like, picking tickets up off, off Bob. But um, but no, not not really. Obviously, I kind of, um, you know, um, it was only when I started playing charity football that I really sort of got to meet and get to, got to know that, that sort of double side that I'd grown up watching. Um, and that was... That was really good, Melvin. That yeah, was really be. that was a oh. great thing to you know. I'm 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 so lucky to have had that. You know that these people who were, you know, kind of boyhood heroes and what would it have been? Kind of nearly twenty years later, you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm playing for the Arsenal vet because even though I was rubbish, because I was rubbish, even though I wasn't quite old enough to be playing for the Arsenal vets, they you know you had to be thirty five, I think. And I wasn't quite 35, but they said, oh, you can come play because you're useless. It's like you're playing off handicap. Do you know what I mean? So I kind of qualified for, qualified as a vet by default. But, you know, you go, hang about, hang about here. I'm like, I'm, there I am playing centre half. I've got Frank McKinnon on one side of me, Pat Rice the other side of me. I've got Peter Story and John Samuels in front. Of me. This, is like, this is like some kind of... It's a, it's a dream when you wake up. <laughs> 100%. And the thing was, they were such, like I say, I cannot speak highly enough of them as people. Just yeah. as people. You know, I, I, yeah, fantastic times. Fantastic times watching them from the clock end. And then, you know, very, very lucky. Uh, fantastic times playing football with and against them. And then, you know, obviously I've done a bit of work for the club in in, on the commercial side, you know, just doing Q and A's with with players and stuff, and and obviously with some of those older players as well. And so again, you sort of you connect with them in a completely different way. Again, it's just yeah, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. I've got to ask you a question. I don't expect you to go into detail. 
just tell you what I think, which I don't I don't understand what happened, but I'll say you just can say, well, it just that's the way of life. I thought it was I used to love watching uh, the arts. Arsenal used to have their own channel and you had a program on it. I yeah. Find, I used to think it was fantastic. And for some reason it went. I don't have to know why. It might be just run out of steam. I don't know all political. I don't I'm not interested. But I was so upset. Yeah, well, I think it, it was um well what you've got to remember is to actually run a TV channel does cost quite a bit in terms of setting up the studio, putting cameras in, putting, you know, to be mm. able to do, because a lot of the shows we did were live, like the phone-ins I used to do on, I did them on Friday nights for a while, That's did them right. on Sunday nights for a while, I used to go away and do little documentary films for them and stuff, and that stuff is expensive. Um, mm. You know, you would think in the grand scheme of things, not that expensive, but still, it's expensive. And I would guess... You know, at the time, I kind of understood, really. I thought probably there weren't the numbers. Oh, right. Particularly, particularly because when it when the channel first started, what was it called? Arsenal TV, wasn't it? Yeah, it was I, think Arsenal cool. I think it was called that. When yeah. it first started, it was bundled up. So if you got... Um, now, what would it have been? It was one of those... It's when It was bundled up with, like, maybe Satanta or one of those. Not, mm. not with Sky... But with no. one of the other satellite channels that come in. So if you subscribe to that channel, you used to get Arsenal TV thrown in for nothing. And then, you know, the the, the Satan or wherever it was, um, they would pay Arsenal a little bit to have it on that would help cover the costs. And then, of course, really, eventually, you were just left with Sky for a long while. And it wasn't... Um, you You had to pay. It was another cost was to go on to the Sky platform. Yeah. So I think Arsenal probably looked at it and went, well, you know, it's not really, it's not really the numbers to justify the expense. You know what I mean? That perhaps people are kind of picking up um, bits and pieces about Arsenal elsewhere. Because um, you had to staff it. You know, you had producers, you had directors, you had camera people, you had editors, you had all of these, you know, it was, it was a quite a big kind of undertaking and i think what what really happened was you know the arsenal website kind of took off and so it it sort of migrated online because of course online you could have worldwide coverage not just uk coverage as well so i think that i kind of understood why it happened really um i think it you know it was it was good crack and i think people who used to watch it and people who used to like it really liked it a lot. Yeah, I did. But I've got one of those, Tom. Yeah, but I think that was relatively, relatively speaking, not big numbers. Yeah, you know what I mean? Okay, I there would be a lot of people. There were would be a lot of people who didn't watch, who could have watched, and then there'd be even more people who couldn't watch. Yeah, because they didn't. Yeah, you know what I mean? So, um, I, I I don't know if they tried a kind of subscription model with it. A kind of five, you know, if you'd if if we'd stuck with it, I don't know. You know, MUTV still exists. Yeah. Um, Liverpool still have their own channel. Um, you know, but it's quite a big undertaking to actually set up uh, a channel. Well, if, if Arsenal, I know I'm gonna, you think I'm touching my forelock here with you, but I'm not that type of guy. But if Arsenal do go forward and think, you know what? We need something like that because they could do it now. And it would make it wouldn't cost that much relative to what the, how big the club is now. So I, I wish they have someone. You know, you could be again. You did it. So, not just saying you did it very well. And it wasn't just because it was Arsenal. It was the content was good. In a way, it was put across was good. It's yeah, a shame. I mean, it, it is quite a while ago now. I think I, I, I'm definitely what um, you know Florentino Perez describes as a legacy fan. I'm not I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't claim to. Uh, you know, I, d I don't think that I would be in any way kind of representative now, um, even if I was representative back then of of Arsenal supporters. Gen you know, I think that had a there was a time for that, and that it was really good. Don't get me wrong, Melvin. I, I used to really good. enjoy doing it. We had great, you know, we used to have great phone calls with, um, you know, great guests. Go and make these little films with people like, you know, we did a whole series of kind of where are they nows. They were really enjoyable to do, and 
as I say, the, the people who did watch, I think, really enjoyed it. But I understand why. And, you know, things move on. Things yeah. move on. And, uh, you know, it, it, it is now a kind of gen different generation that's picked up um, and kind of, I think, follow football in a slightly different way, really. Um, yeah, the audience is probably a little bit different, Tom, I suppose. Yes, you're right. The audience yeah, is right. absolutely. Absolutely. You know, if they wanted to start a kind of, you know, like a saga Arsenal channel, like Arsenal Channel for old geese, <laughs> then I'd, I'd be a shoe in, mate. But, um, you know, I, I think now, generally, I, I, understandably, perhaps their uh, their focus is on the future rather than on the likes of you and me, mate. More's the pity. More's the pity. But in I fact, think that's. Right. Just before we go, I just want to show yeah. people this. I mean, people know you've done so much uh, in, in your past and present, but this is the, the book that I've got. Really, I read, oh, yeah. I read it years ago, Tom. Um, yeah, and I to prove that it's not just taken from somewhere, I've actually got it on me. I moved that's house crazy. recently and I got my books together. Aha, uh -huh. can't forget that. So that's on my yeah. shelf over there. So, really good read. It, it's uh, basically a bit of nostalgia, a bit of people's, a bit like this program tries to be a bit of getting people's feelings of what it was like years ago. That it's not always, yeah, I, you've got it written yeah, down here. Brilliant. I mean, that was the first book that ever applied oral history techniques to football. Because, um, you know, obviously there is a lot of kind of pure and simple nostalgia about teams and players and one thing and another. But, you know, there's a lot of kind of social history and what what went on on the North Bank and why it was important to people and how people grew up on it and formed friendships and, you know, everything that kind of went with well, it takes us back to where we started, the whole thing of going to football. You know, standing on the North Bank was never just about watching the football. It was no. about everything else around it. And, you know, it changed as, as society and as Islington changed and, you know, as, as football changed. So it, all of that was reflected on the North Bank. And, um, and I just, when, after the Hillsborough disaster, um, I just had a feeling that when all the, because obviously the terraces had to go, you know, um, we we were looking at, at moving to, into the era of all-seater stadia. And I thought, well, it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same. And, of course, it isn't. And I just thought, do you know, I just feel like I need to capture that before it goes. Yeah. Because all of those things are stories that were never written down. They're just stories that were in people's memories, stories that people had lived together. You know, had lived, you know, experiences that people had, had lived through together. And if you, if you don't catch them when they're still fresh in people's minds, then they disappear, you know, and, and they get changed because they're looking at, that. you know, they're experiencing football in different ways. So I really wanted to do that book. And, you know, what's lucky with that book, no, not lucky, it's the case, and it's why I called it The End, is that that is a book that will never go out of, it will never be out of date. Correct. That's absolutely it right. Tells the story of the end until the end. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I mean, I, I, as I say, I read it years ago. I loved it. I think I got it just after you, you published it. It was published rather, and it's something that's always in my room, always there. I haven't read. I read. Through, I actually had to flip through it again. And I've got one. Not that you wrote this bit. There's a bit about uh, with Charlie George that all the different chance players had. There was a section I think on. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And one of yeah. them, someone wrote, not you, because you have you have people writing in as well. He's here, he's there, he's every something where. And the guy said it's Charlie George. It wasn't. It was Bobby Gould. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. No, Charlie was. Um, Charlie, Charlie, Charlie was King of Ivory, wasn't he? Yeah, Charlie. Charlie born is the King of Ivory. Yeah, um, he was the first of those. Yeah, of course, Charlie Nick come along later and had the same song. But um, no, absolutely. Uh, it, it, you know, and that, that's what I mean about how things changed, fashions changed, society changed. And so the North Bank changed with it. And it really wanted, you know, I wanted to tell that story. And I was lucky because when I did it, I think the book was published in uh, 93. So when I was putting the book together, because it was all from interviews. It was all yeah. either interviews. A few people kind of wrote in letters and I edited them. And then Arsenal... The club were actually very good, gave me access to <clears throat> all the match programs going back to 1913, all the board me minutes of board meetings right through until basically in until about when the roof went on the North Bank. 
they they obviously thought it probably wouldn't be a good idea to be quoting board minutes when there's directors who are still alive. Do you know what I mean? They they, yes, they yeah. kind of but that was great because of course that was it was the earlier stuff that I really need kind of help with. Um, you know, the laundry and becoming the North Terrace and then becoming the North Bank and all that. Um and the the to be able to go out and, and kind of talk to people and get those men. And of course, I was able to speak to people who were at the very first game at Highbury, who stood on the North Bank, you know, the very, yeah, against Leicester City. Yeah. You know, and Leicester Leicester Boss. People, Leicester Boss. You know, and there was there was a there was an old fella, what was his name? I can't remember the fella's name, but he remembered, you know, like it bunking in to to that first game there was like you know because the, the ground wasn't really finished and there was kind of bits of timber and stuff lying around and he remember getting under a, a big kind of pile of timber and sneaking underneath to get up onto the north bank for the first ever game and stuff wow. um but he was yeah yeah it's funny because he was a he, what was his name it's a lovely old boy he, he he was living in a sheltered accommodation somewhere in North, north uh, up up the Holloway Road somewhere, and I remember getting introduced to him. I don't know how I found him, but I went and talked to him, and his memories were really clear. But he was in quite kind of far down the line of of what we now know would be Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, Do you know yeah, what I mean? yeah, yes, the, yeah. The weird thing was he, he didn't really know anything about the Arsenal now. But you went back to the kind of 20s and the teens and he remembered like, and I remember taking him, I actually took him to a game after I'd met him and he told me his oh, story no. and all this. And I actually took him, I took him to a game and uh, it kind of passed him by. Do you know what I mean? It weren't, yes, yeah. Didn't really connect with him at all. It was, it was amazing. But, but like I say, because of the timing, in 93, it was 60 years previous. Uh, sorry, uh, 80, 80 years previous. Yeah. Um, and so there, you know, there were guys, there were a couple of people I spoke to oh, yeah, 80 years. who were in their 90s. This guy wow. was one of them who remembered as kids going to the first ever game. Well, actually, one who remembered the first ever game, one who remembered the first ever seat. Um, did, so, did, you, yeah. did you question him, Tom, about the 30s era at all? If you go back to the book, that everything is in there. There is, as it happened. Like, but, but these guys the you spoke to, did he mention the thirties as well or not? Yeah, yeah, not him, but other oh, people. Him. No, all right, but it's in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh no, lots of people. Oh, no, no, the twenties and thirties. By then, you're talking quite a lot of people who remembered that thirties, especially lots of people who um, who remembered that, and and you know, you, you've even got people who. Um, no, well, people who did actually, I mean, people like Reg Lewis, who I'm pretty sure was, was he a junior when war broke out? Or you know, he might have been playing first team football by, by then, by the end of um, the 30s, you know, when the, when the Second World War broke out. So, you know, even talking about players' memories from that time. Wow. And then, of course, there was also a whole tradition then particularly at Arsenal, but I think na nationally, really, of players, um, you know, because you've got to remember, obviously, players weren't, they weren't retiring and they all of them had to have jobs, you know what I mean, when they retired. So, yeah, people, you know, great, great players would go off and they'd do their autobiography as a little earner at the end of their career or even before the end of their career. So, I've got those to draw on their memories of playing in front of the North Bank and of playing during the 30s and, you know, People like Eddie Hatfield and um, Wolf Cotton and um, Alex James wow. and you know people wow. who did their their all, but I managed to get hold of the books and wow. nick bits that were relevant to the North Bank and stuff. So it's a fairly kind of complete history of, of standing up at Highbury. It's not a history of Highbury because obviously there was a lot that happened yeah, after. Course. You know, this is long before the the Wenger era and stuff, but. Football as as the the kind of sport you know the the game that we grew up watching and stuff and 
and people used to stand in their thousands and watch. That's pretty well captured in that book. And I know there's, you know, there's supporters of other clubs who've, who've gone to that book and found stuff that, because obviously it was, you know, you're standing on the Stretford End or the Kibax or yeah. the Shed or, you know, wherever. It's basically, you know, it's a different team you're, you're cheering for, but same experience. I mean, it's also you've got to know, if, if sometimes you, it helps to know your past, to know where you are now. It, you, you, sometimes you can you can see how it all moves along. It, it's a story there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, there is a story there. I mean, obviously we've had some pretty big dislocations since then, both for good and not so good, you know. Yeah. I mean, in, in many ways, arson was a real change. Everything changed when Arsene came, and obviously for the better in in mm. almost every respect. Um, but it was a real kind of, and then obviously <clears throat> right around the time that book came out, of course, was when when Sky and the Premier League started, which has also changed. You know, was massive dislocation, and I really do think that all seat stadia have made a very big difference. You know, you sit down. You stand up, you're a supporter, you sit down, you're a customer. And, yes, um, yes, yes, yes. You know, uh, you're, it, it is a different experience, uh, which is probably why I sneak off and watch League One football near where I live on a pretty regular basis because I can go and stand behind the goal again like I did when I was a kid and misbehave and, you know, ask about it with my mates and stuff. I do quite like that, even though the, it's crowds of three and a half thousand instead of. 40 or 50,000, but there are certain things I miss now, but yes. I can go and find them somewhere else, so happy days. Well, well, thanks very much, Tom, for coming on. I thought we'd be as good as this, but uh, it was. It's fantastic. Thanks for giving me your time. Thanks no, for absolutely me. a pleasure, mate. It's always good to speak to you, and uh, let's hope we can do it, not only tomorrow night, but as a big one Sunday. Let's hope we do it, eh? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Up the arsenal. Up the arsenal. Thanks, Tom. All the best. See you, mate. Pleasure. Bye. Pleasure. Bye.